Okay. It's okay. This is to call the November 17th meeting of the Wilmette Board of Library Trustees to order. Appropriate notices have been given. And can we have a roll call, Trustee Barshis? Sure. Trustee Barshis <clears throat> here. Trustee Fishman. Six here. Trustee Johnson. Absent. Trustee Rogers. Here. Or, I'm sorry, Trustee Riddle. Here. Trustee Rogers. Here. Trustee Wolf. Here. And Trustee McDonald. Here. Behind attachment one are the minutes. Just from... one, one second, Lisa. Okay. Um, it looks like Trustee Johnson is connecting. Okay. And, um, we also have some guests on the call. So I want to acknowledge everyone who's present um, on our call this evening. Okay. Um, we are joined by our auditor, Dan Berg, who'll be giving a presentation here shortly. Um, we have a representative from the League of Women Voters, um, Georgia Gebhardt, and we're joined by several staff members. I see Kim Hegland, uh, John Risco, Gail Justman, Jessica Thompson, Patsy Devono, Linda Dahl, and Marty Belfontaine. Thank you. So going back to the minutes, uh, you've got the October 20 minutes. Do you have any public comment? Oh. <laughs> I'm really rushing it, aren't I? <laughs> to, to get out of here. Is there any public comment? This is the time if you've got any comments regarding policies or the agenda to voice it. Okay. Barring none, let us move to the minutes. The minutes for October 20th or behind attachment one. Is there a motion to move, approve the minutes? I move to okay. approve the October 20th minutes. A second. There, okay. So Joan has second, Joan Fishman has moved to approve the minutes and Jan Barshis has seconded it. Is there any discussion or corrections? Hearing none, can we have a roll call of for the minutes, approval of the minutes? Sure. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. <laughs> Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. Uh, we now have, uh, you all have all received the audit. And so Mr. Berg, Dan Berg will be presenting it and giving a presentation. Hey, it worked, <laughs> I think. By the smiles, I think I did it right. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you all for having me and thank you for moving me uh, to the top of the agenda, I greatly appreciate it. I got a seven o'clock uh, Zoom call for uh, Crystal Lake Library, as a matter of fact. So um, I just want to report to you that the audit went uh, pretty smoothly. Um, we're breaking John in, uh, or breaking him, as the case may be. Um, but, it, but being that it's uh, his first go around with us, with the library's audit, and uh, a cash basis, uh, there was a lot, lot of conversation between he and I and our, and our manager, Martha Trotter. Uh, so I, I hope he feels like I do that it went pretty smoothly. Uh, you have before you the work product. And if you'd like, I can hit a few highlights and walk you through it a little bit. Get a nod, so I'll go ahead and do that. We'll start with the annual financial report. Uh, when, when you have a successful audit, uh, the annual financial report is thicker than the board communication. If you weren't uh, uh, such a clean audit, then we'd have a lot more to say in the auditor communication, and that would be thicker. Uh, a lot of people think the annual financial report is getting a little thick itself. But So just starting out, the only part of the report on pages one through three that is truly ours is the 
in independent auditors report. Everything else is drawn from representations made by management or the financial data that we accumulate during the course of the audit, including the trial balances and financial statements. So in this audit at the top of page two is our opinion. Commonly referred to as a clean opinion, we refer to it as an unmodified opinion. Best opinion we're allowed to give, and it simply states that the financial statements present fairly in all material, material respects, and that's pretty much as good as it gets. Uh, we do have uh, a note right below it stating that this is on the modified cash basis of accounting and the cash basis of accounting. So. Modified meaning uh, the very first financial statement has capital assets in it. Uh, cash basis meaning that it won't. So with that, we can flip over to the management discussion and analysis written by staff. I always recommend that this is a good starting point for those unfamiliar with the financial statements uh, as it compares last year to this year and attempts to explain what changed between the two years. Also, it talks a little bit about uh, the effects of COVID-19 on the operations. Uh, and, and going forward, I think uh, most, most of my clients are saying, we don't know how it's gonna affect us going forward. It just, it's hard to for. So with that, flipping over to page four, this is a financial statement that includes the capital assets and focus on the bottom of the financial statements, we see the net position and we always list it in the order that you cannot spend it. So you're invested in capital assets that you're building your plant, the contents, uh, net of accumulated depreciation. That's the portion of equity that you can't spend and stay in business. In terms of all of the parts that you have taxed for or restricted by moving money over to the uh, special reserve fund. Uh, so when you have a line item in your tax levy dedicated for audit, liability, insurance, retirement, et cetera, we, we have to show that it's restricted to spend on those specific purposes. And the last item is the unrestricted was uh, $8.9 million. Uh, flipping over to page five is the statement of activities. It's shaped like a seven, starting with expenses, program revenues, and then trying to show the portion of the expenses that would need to be funded by involuntary resource providers. Taxes. So total of $6.1 million worth of expenses, uh, only uh, charges for services, pretty much fees per capita grant, and then the net is uh, uh, 5.8 million to be funded by taxes for the most part in general revenues. So change in net position basically is the piece that um, if your constituents were to ask you if you're better off this year than last, if this a positive number, you'd say economically you're better off. It's slightly negative. It's about as close to break even as you can possibly get of only $8,500, $8,600. Flipping over to page six is the balance sheet on the cash basis. Focus again down at the bottom of the page, the fund balance section. We're sh again showing the restrictions, which are uh, uh, the same as are on the statement of it, uh, net position. And we 8.9 million dollars of fund balance in the general fund and almost six million dollars worth of fund balance in the special reserve fund so flipping over one more page page eight the, the changes in fund balance on the cash basis the general fund finished the year third line from the bottom up two hundred and seventy six thousand dollars uh, did not transfer money to the Special Reserve Fund this year. Special Reserve Fund did have some $300,000 worth of capital expenditures. So it did a, a reduction of fund balance there of $180,000. There's only a couple other pages. Does anybody have any questions so far? Um, 
This is Dan. Mm -hmm. Is this a good time? Anybody else wants to ask, or is this okay? This is Go ahead, Dan. Thank you. Um, so $9 million or $8.9 million in the general operating fund balance. Mm -hmm. um, do you as an auditor sort of express an opinion on the, you know, whether that's reasonable or unreasonable, or is that really not your job to do as an auditor? As a taxpayer or as an auditor? As an, Straight. <laughs> Either I, one my, if you want. As an audit, I don't live in Wilmette, so. Um, but as an auditor, my uh, job is just to tell you whether the numbers are accurate or not. Gotcha. Okay. Thank really you give an opinion. Um, okay. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. It's that you're thinking more along the lines of Moody's and Standards and Poor's. Gotcha. What are they right. called? Like underwriters, basically? No, no. Those are those are uh, uh, financial uh, agency ratings. Agency ratings, correct? Uh, so they would they would rate uh, give you a rating for the use of bond sales for the most part. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So, can, uh, Peter, you had a question, didn't you? That was my same question. If he offered any any opinion on the balances of of the general fund. No, but I understand there is some discussion. I'd be happy to answer any questions about the upcoming fund balance policy or the discussed fund balance policy. Um, sure. I mean, we can talk about the policy if 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 that's at a later point in your discussion. I would. No, it's it's not. Um, most most of the time, uh, you would compare your operating expenses to your unrestricted fund balance and make a decision of what do you need it to, to, to maintain uh, um, a fund balance uh, that would feel comfortable to the board and to the public. And by comfortable, uh, the number is slightly higher. Well, sometimes it's a lot higher in Illinois than other states. Uh, and, and generally speaking, during this pandemic, I think a, a lot of my clients are looking at a, a higher number of months or percentage of those operating expenses. The larger the entity, the lower the percent. So if you were a $100 million entity, having 25% in balance might be a lot. Uh, you know, but a, as small an entity as you are, the percentage necessarily goes up to your comfort level, if that makes sense. It does. Dan, do you, have you reviewed our general fund policy? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yep. and have you found in comparison with maybe other libraries this size, is that fund policy, uh, you know, comparable? Are there it certain... Is aspects or, or items that we could expand on? It is. Um, you might want to um, focus on comparing your, well, so using operating expenses as shown here in the report is comparing future desired reserves to historic numbers. So what I usually recommend is that the future desired reserves be compared to budget, for example. So instead of comparing it, and we can flip over to um, page 25, which is the budget to actual page. So generally speaking, uh, your budget's going to be a little higher than your actual, right? I mean, you, you, you generally more conservative in your spending than you are in, um, in the, so you want to make sure that you're under budget. But from a fund balance policy, oftentimes a lot of my clients compare their their balance to operating expense, uh, operating budget, as opposed to um, actual expenses, because you want to make sure you can fund the future. The other issue is when you're trying to cre create a, a policy to decide whether a year, 100% uh, of that operating expense is the adequate amount, try to visualize worst case scenarios of property taxes rolling in late, of property taxes not being collected 100% in any given year, uh, things of that nature that would 
have an effect on your cash flows. There have been cases uh, over the years where the second installment for Cook County has been postponed, if you will, simply because tax bills were late in getting out. Uh, and currently, uh, I believe the treasurer is saying that it's okay to pay a little bit late. There won't be as stiff a penalty for doing so. Dan, generally, what's how many months or a year or what's the term that most of your clients in public municipalities keep in operating reserves? So for, again, uh, the smaller the entity, the larger the percent. And for an entity of the $5 million to $10 million range in operating expenses where you just clear the $5 million, the floor is oftentimes uh, six months of operating expenses. So that's the minimum target, and the, uh, the, the ceiling, if you will, is oftentimes either a year or slightly longer. Some of that depends on capital needs in a, in a library and um, uh, expected major maintenance issues, if you will, whether they have enough in special reserve or or need more in special reserve down the road. Does that make sense? Am I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying not to dance. I'm trying to. No, no. It's I a range. It's, yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's very much a range and it's a comfort level. And it's a lot of it has to do with the age of the building, uh, the age of the community. In other words, the usage of, of the building and tolerance for debt. And so, may I? So are, are we at, if you combine the appetite or the need for capital, which we certainly have uh, with sort of our general worst case scenario planning, if we're looking at six to maybe a few months above 12, if you combine our capital and our operating, looks like we're at 30 months. The, the problem with being an auditor is I'm a financial historian and I haven't really analyzed your five-year capital plan or your future capital needs. Sure, but I, I just want to just check that so, we're at 30 months right now. Is yeah, that yeah. true? Is that so? I, I don't know. Are we at, Dan, you say that. Sure. Are, the balance, the balance is what Dan's talking about. That amount is about 30 months rather than a six month is what versus a six month to a year is what Dan was discussing. 30 months of comparing it to the general funds operating expenses, I would agree. However, I have no idea what your capital plans are for the special reserve fund in the coming years. I mean, literally you, a lot of my clients have a five or 10 year capital plan. I had one client that tried to ladder out its entire uh, capital asset portfolio, the, the, the Lake Bluff Park District a few years ago in order to determine what the sustainability of the park district. And they, the, the capital needs, you know, 10 years out were astronomical. But so just to be clear, we have 18 months in operating and 12 months in capital. That's just the fact, and whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, that's up to somebody else. But that's where we're at. Is that accurate, Dan? Mm -hmm. Pretty close to that, yes. And your clients are generally between six and maybe a little bit over 12, is what you're well, seeing? I, I would say that they were uh, there, the floor, the minimum was at six. So I think that uh, if I were to look at most of my libraries, they'd be well above six, um, pushing nine to 12, I would say at, 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 is where they're at these days. And um, some aren't as aggressive moving money from the operating to special reserve as others. They're very tentative uh, in this environment. Uh, so I have a number of libraries this year that aren't moving anything over for a little while, and they're going to stay above 12 months for the time being, just out of, uh, you know, 
that ju just to be as careful as, as humanly possible because generally speaking most attorneys will and auditors will tell you once you move it into special reserve fund unless you spend it on capital it really should not be moved back into operations we've just completed a 20-year capital needs study which anticipates um, more need over that time period than we currently have in our reserve fund. Um, in addition to that, um, there are, that does not include, that's just building maintenance and operations requirements. That does not include any enhancements in library service or upgrading the usable space in the building. So that's just keeping the building and the, the grounds um, uh, in safe order and in, in compliance with code requirements and other factors. So um, no, no, re, no remodeling, no re-envisioning, sorry. What's no remodeling or revisioning what a library will look like? Ten we have. That's there's mainly, the capital is just basically maintenance. Oh, okay. It's maintenance in terms of roofs, getting rid of the basement mold, not mold, but water problems. It's just maintenance. There's no bells and whistles or re major renovations. It's just routine maintenance. And traditionally, I believe we look at, after we get your statement, which we just got, we then look at what we might transfer over to reserves after it's been finalized. Got it, okay. Mm -hmm. No, but we're going to need more money to cover those expenses, plus any changes in building to, to enhance services uh, over the course of the 20 year period that's anticipated in that study. Um, that's not to say that we're in any kind of a stress situation, uh, but um, we're looking at financial reserve policies. Uh, we're going to upgrade those, and we will be making some adjustments based not only on the capital needs, but also on um, other changes that um, might be anticipated in order to enhance service. So. Um, this audit helps us in documenting where we are, um, but we have not completed the discussions of where we need to be. Got it. So do you have other things that you'd like to share with us regarding the audit? Um, there's, there's a couple of pages that um, you might find interesting as a board. Um, on page 39 of the report, IMRF status, uh, funding status, if you will. And, and remember that this is as of a calendar year end and it's measured as of 12-31-2019, which was a very good time to be measuring a portfolio. If you think back, we all had 501Ks, um, whereas 12-31 in 2018, we had 301Ks maybe. Um, so it's up to 97.7%, the third row from the bottom that has percentages there, uh, up 12.5% 12 12 from 2018. So there's nothing you need to worry about, nothing you want to do uh, to make these numbers better or whatever you are required to contribute based on uh, monthly covered payroll percentage that is prescribed to you annually by IMRF. So, um, but, but I have had clients in the past add money voluntarily to IMRF. I don't see that as being necessary or advisable at all. And if you want to see why those numbers go up and down at, like they are, if you look under the bolded plan fiduciary net position uh, mm -hmm. section and three rows down is net investment income, Back to 2014, when it was 630,000, the following year was 53,000, heck of a drop. 
to 730, 730,000 the following year, $2 million in 2017, and a negative $700,000 in 2018, back up to $2 million in 2019. So as the investments of IMRF are measured on one day in time, and then all of the investments are marked to market, that's what's causing this large fluctuation from one year to the next. Now, IMRF does smooth the rates over a five year. So they do a five year smoothing of all of the assumptions and uh, the actual activity comparison to try to flatten that rate fluctuation. On the preceding page, you can see that you're up at 12 and a third percent on page 38 in 2015. And in 2020, you're down to 10.2%. Coming down slowly but surely over the last uh, six years. That's, that's one thing I'm um, a kind of hot topic at a lot of governments. Remember, you're an IMRF, the, the retirement fund that well in Illinois. Uh, and that's pretty much it. The preceding page, page 36 and 37, shows your tax um, tax rates, the amount that you tax, and the assessed valuation, equal assessed valuation on which the taxes are based. Kind of in your look back and a lot of uh, elected officials and citizens think that's interesting. Us accountants do anyway. So with that, any other questions I'd be happy to entertain um, on this work product or the uh, board communication? <laughs> Dan, I have a question on some of your policy review and some of the um, outstanding um, the outstanding um, recommendations that you have for um, independence and separate segregation of duties. Um, do you have any general uh, our policies? We we are due to review them um, this year and. Um, they haven't been reviewed, I believe, in about some of them in about two to three years. So I just want to see if um, you have any general comments, kind of what lessons learned, what to, what to probably, uh, you know, some guidance there in comparison with your other reviews. And then also um, some suggestions, if you give us a, some suggestions, this is a smaller staff for the segregation of duties and independence. Uh, for an internal control, some some guidance there that you've seen uh, folks do with a smaller size staff. Thanks. And, and that segregation of duties column uh, comment has been um, one that I will consistently make at entities uh, of the, your district size, uh, regardless of the type of entity, basically, there's just not enough accountants to, to put a second and third set of eyes on every transaction. That said, the concentration of approvals on purchasing from the department head level to John, to Anthony, and then to you has significant oversight. Um, payroll has significant oversight for the most part. The areas that are less susceptible to over, or less available to oversight, like cash receding at the front counter, where you have multiple people working the front counter in any given hour, let alone any given shift, is a little less uh, controllable. However, the dollar level that you're talking about coming across in the form of cash it's, it, it decreases annually with more and more people using plastic and, and fewer and fewer libraries, quite frankly, charging for fines or pursuing collection, if, if you will, um, that the, the dollar amount doesn't necessarily um, require additional controls. There's a cost benefit there. So, and we did go fine free. So a lot except of people for lost books. Yeah, especially for periods of time during this calendar year, um, you know, when you were closed or what have you. Um, so 
that's that's one of the areas that is less controllable and 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 where cash is being uh trans used in transactions you're always going to be susceptible um but i do review as a team uh, us auditors review your policies procedures and walk through several transactions of each kind during the course of the audit and we haven't really come up with anything substantial for improvements. It, there's been odds and ends we've talked about with staff uh, over the years. Um, nothing really comes to mind offhand. The, um, the narrative or the detail provided in some of the policies has been something that I've, I, I have a, um, I, I'm a bank, I have a bank regulation background. I worked at the Reserve Bank for 18 years. And so I was wondering, you know, how much, how much narrative, how much, you know, kind of step-by-step -step procedure should we be documenting in these policies or, you know, kind of a general, they seem to be more general and, you know, and that's safe, sense. I think in some ways, because over the years, it tends to stay true and, um, you know, probably requires less and less um, annual review versus, you know, something that, you know, kind of, because it, it really, I think, would reflect the practices that we're, that we're actually putting into place. But let me know what you think about kind of a longer step-by-step -step procedure policy versus a general, general narrative policy. So generally speaking, governmental entities um, uh, are, aren't tremendous at re, uh, reflecting day-to-day -day activities in a narrative form. And they're better at creating a policy, for instance, for purchasing or for vacation time usage or personal time usage, things like that, that are at saying, okay, how we do a individ, a, 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 an individual transaction on here's how we do the oddball transactions. So what we like to see as auditors is step by step, who does what, who's the second person to look at, how does the paper flow or lack thereof go between individuals and use titles as opposed to um, people's names. But traditionally governmental entities don't, are understaffed and don't have time to, to, to write up as detailed a policy as you're used to in the banking industries. So it's kind of a, uh, we cajole our clients into, you know, what we would like to see more detail. We would like to see uh, for training purposes or succession planning purposes, more is better. So it's not unusual to not see uh, a tremendous detail. Um, and we hope that our clients get a little better every year. Thanks for that. Any other questions for Mr. Berg? Okay, thank you. I did one last thing. I just wanted to point out, we only okay. adjusting journal entries, outstanding job. Nice job. Thank you, John. Say that a little bit more as to what you mean by that, since you so, sort of threw so that in at the end. During, during, uh, during the course of, uh, in this work product, uh, the uh, required communication to the board, we're required to put in the journal entries that we proposed and made uh, with the agreement of management. So on page five, there's only two adjusting journal entries. One of them is assisting in, in posting the activity for capital assets recording the transfer for the endowment okay. that's that's pretty pretty good that we only had two adjusting journal entries and the capital asset one is one that we make at a lot of our clients assisting in recording uh, the asset activity annually so well done thank you Any other questions? Once, going once, going twice. <laughs> you can make your next meeting. Thank I'm you. With plenty of time to spare. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Take Thanks. care, everybody. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay, moving to Trustee Rogers for our treasurer's report.
Okay, you have the treasurer's report in your packet, uh, or the financial report, I should say. Um, the um, uh, tax revenue in the past month was 276000 and change. Uh, we had uh, uh, a little over 13000 in general fund interest and 35,000 in per capita grant receipts. Um, otherwise, everything is pretty much uh, normal. Um, we're slightly below the three month rate of uh, one third of the uh, annual budget uh, in expenditures. And the primary expenses have been in for materials, insurance, uh, employee insurance, um, and the online services that we're spending more on in the current climate. Uh, so there's really nothing, there are no surprises in the financial report. Uh, it's pretty much uh, continuation of what our status has been. Are there any questions about the uh, financial report? Okay, uh, the next item is uh, payment of bills and salaries for October. Um, I move that we approve the bills and salaries as uh, included in the attach in attachment three uh, for the month of October. I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by Trustee Wolf that we uh, move to approve the bills and salaries included in the October 20, 2000, 2020 uh, report. Is there any discussion? Okay, can we have a roll call? Sure. <clears throat> Trustee Parshes? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? How about Trustee no? And just to be clear, since Janet asked a couple months ago, and I'll repeat myself, it's uh, just a policy matter that I think our budget's too high and our reserves are too high, but nothing specific about this particular month. Thank you. Okay. And Trustee Riddle? Yes. Okay. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. So it's been approved, the motion's been approved with 16 trustees voting yay and Trustee Johnson voting nay. Let's move on to action items. And so we're gonna start with the Lira renewal for property and casualty and workers insurance that was just received last week. So Trustee Austin, Director Austin, do you wanna go with that. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, uh, last Thursday um, was the annual meeting uh, with Lyra and um, included in your packet is um, the one page uh, summary of what our policy includes, as well as an explanation uh, about 10 pages worth of the presentation materials, um, citing what the climate of the insurance market is right now and explaining um, some of the, the, the increase. Uh, the bottom line increase for our insurance coverage this year is 18%. Um, uh, that's a, a large increase. Um, but uh, I think as we get into those numbers, and I can explain a little bit more, um, what our insurance company has been describing to us is that it is a quote unquote hard market, largely due in fact to um, a lot of property damage that has been sustained nationwide due to um, I guess what we could call a, a climate crisis. Um, there's been a lot of uh, extreme weather and that has driven damage to a number of buildings. Um, and uh, that is why the exposures have increased. Um, so when you look at uh, the cost comparison document, you'll see that our package, um, as we go through this, this is the, the document that I'm looking at here. Um, you'll see that um, our insurable values have only gone up um, ever so slightly by about uh, 300,000. Um, our package for property liability, auto and crime actually went down even though we added an automobile this year. Um, so that's interesting uh, that the costs are down. Um, the excess property is really where the large increase is and there's um, just about $5,000 worth of increase there on that line. And that's the piece that I was just describing. That's the market um, for, for uh, property has, has substantially gone up. Um, 
The other areas where you see some increases is um, with the cyber and identity theft line. That one's um, about doubled. Uh, again, that is due in part to a lot of folks taking advantage of technology, particularly this year. There's a lot of uh, criminal activity taking place online. Um, and um, particularly with unemployment fraud and um, other matters uh, that could um, affect, uh, that, that could take place um, via technology. Uh, so our cyber uh, policy covers that. Um, the other piece that, that was added this year and marks a $1,700 increase was approved um, unanimously by the board earlier this year. And that is our crisis protect policy. And this is also a reflection of some changes in our culture. Uh, so um, this particular product covers a whole range of, of very extreme crises, and we're seeing uh, a rise in these um, nationwide. Um, and I'll just briefly summarize what's covered by this particular part of the policy. So it covers assault, blackmail, civil commotion, cyber extortion, deprivation, detention, disappearance, emergency repatriation, employee dishonesty, extortion, hijacking, a hostage crisis, kidnapping, product tampering, radicalization, that's interesting, uh, sabotage, stalking, terrorism, general threats, and vicious attack. Um, so just give so it, go ahead. Like Austin. Austin. What you meant was the Lira board approved it, not our board, when you said it. You said the board approved it. The Lira board did, yeah, yes. Yeah, okay, so the, in terms uh, the, of clarification. Thank you, yes. The, the, the 50 plus uh, members of uh, member libraries as part of the Lira pool elected to all go forward with this, recognizing that there was a demand to have a product like this to protect our agencies. Um, so that, that nominal investment of 1700 could definitely cover us for um, a, a substantial crisis. Uh, so that was, um, that was in addition. Beyond that, all the other expenses are right in line. And um, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have either from the packet of materials or any other um, Lira related questions. Thanks, Anthony. I, I, I feel like that category you just read, I, I mean, it seems like it would be so unlikely, but it's, it's, I, I, it's so real and I've obviously hit home. When you read when you read assault this this past you know was it september anthony yeah. so thanks for sharing that thank you um any other questions about uh the lira proposal is there a motion to approve the lira proposal for forty six thousand eight hundred and fifty three dollars for 2021 I'll, I'll motion to approve Trustee Riddle has approved. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, Trustee Wolf has seconded. It's been moved by Trustee Riddle and seconded by Trustee Wolf. Is there any other discussion? Can we have a roll call, Trustee Barshies? Sure. <clears throat> Trustee Barshies, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. The next item is the cancellation of the December 2020 regular board meeting. Uh, traditionally, we've done quite a bit of work this year. And so there's no real actions that will probably need to happen in December. Is there any concern about our canceling the December 15th meeting? Will this have any effect on the preparation of bid documents that we're anticipating for early in 2021? Uh, no, I have talked about that with our engineer and we believe that we're gonna need the course of the next um, probably six weeks to prepare all the uh, documentation to get the, that project ready for bid. So um, no, I, I anticipate that you'll be seeing that proposal at the January meeting. Okay. If that's the case, I'll motion approval of, of not seeing everybody in December. Okay, <laughs> Trustee, is there a second? I'll second, Trustee Fishman. Okay, Trustee Wolf has moved to cancel the December 15th meeting and Trustee Fishman has seconded it. Can we have a roll call, please? 
Just oh, one, oh, yeah. one quick question. We can have a little question or discussion. I wanted to just see we're we're all we're all able to you know obviously communicate via email or you know if we need to kind of meet or talk about something that comes up in between. Correct. Do it time. As long as you do it in compliance at a time. with the Open Meetings Act, yes. Okay, so if we do have to talk, I guess more than two trustees have to speak or meet via Zoom, we'd have to re publicly record that. Is that right, Anthony? You'd have to publicly announce it. Announce it, I'm sorry. Two weeks announce in it. advance, I think. Is it seven days? I don't know. Two weeks in advance. It's two weeks, okay. Thanks. I think it's less than two weeks, but the bottom line is if we have committee, we could still have committee meetings in December. This only applies to the board meeting. And, and I'm sorry, it's two days, 48 hours notice to publish the agenda. That's what I meeting. thought. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Any other discussion? Can we have a roll call? Mm -hmm. Trustee Thank Barges, you, Barges, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Happy New Year, yes. Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trustee Rogers. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. Trustee McDonald. Yes, it's been moved and seconded and passed by all seven trustees. Okay, next is the annual report. You were sent a link to the annual report for, uh, and it's really a community report as opposed to an annual report for 2019-2020. Did everybody have a chance to go out and look at it? Okay, I sent uh, Director Austin my suggestions. Are there any other suggestions that you all would like to discuss regarding that community report? And my suggestions were twofold, uh, well, three. Basically, I think when you're citing statistics, I think you need to put the time period from the beginning and the end. Yeah. I think secondly, if there's a picture, you need to uh, cite who's on the picture. And third, I had suggested that there need to be a link to any re major report we give to the financial data on the website, the budget, as well as uh, any discussion regarding the green initiative, any green activities that we've done and what our green policy is. Mm -hmm. So those were some of my thoughts. Does anyone else have any other thoughts? Uh, Lisa, um, my, my, I agree with your point number one. It seemed as though um, sometimes it said pre-closure uh, and then and post-closure. I think that should be, so any of the numbers I think should be identified or maybe they were, maybe I just wasn't quite clear, but if, if I wasn't, so that it, it does clearly state when those numbers, the tally. I, I love the report, it's upbeat, it's easy, it's, um, I, I just loved it, but I just think it needs to be, to your point, um, point number one, that apples and apples, so that everything is, is documented. And if it's not apples to apples, exactly when did, did that time period end? Because I think you extended it a little because it didn't come out exactly for a year, a little bit past. So I don't know. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Those are all really great points. And um, we're, we're working on getting those details um, and, and contextualizing all of that. The, the reason that we did expand this particular annual report by a few months is because our fiscal year broke before the library actually reopened and it doesn't really tell the whole story of what happened with the pandemic. Um, so uh, there, there will be some variances and there'll be a big asterisk on this year when we talk about statistics in the long run, um, but you're absolutely correct. I think we, we do need to, to do a better job of contextualizing that. So we'll, we'll add that. Great points. I love the cover. I'll just say too, I thought that was really fun. And I loved all the pictures of, of staff and um, I, I thought that was great. Enjoyed that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if this is being redundant, but I, I really felt like the, the like uh, Trustee Fishman just said that the, the pictures really kind of captured the energy of the library, you know? And I think that that really comes, you know, for, for a, a static document like this annual report, um, whoever mm -hmm. designed it did a really good job to kind of convey I think everything that, that this our library is all about and, and, and how it how it feels. So Anthony, is that Sarah Rose who designed it or in-house? 
Yep, it's our communications team. So Sarah Beth and Sarah Rose work together to create this document and design the graphics, collect and, sure. and, uh, and get all those pictures. So yep, it's, that's the team. Tell them kudos. Will do. Um, we also intend to uh, provide um, a, uh, I guess, a static version of this document because it, it really does kind of, it has movement. Uh, that's kind of the design of the Adobe Spark platform is that it's, it takes something that's kind of flat and makes it more interesting um, and adds layers and a bit of dimension to it. Um, what we do intend to do though, however, is to create a print piece to go along with this that's a little easier to share uh, in-house. Obviously, we'll get to that here in a moment. That's probably not something that we're going to be needing uh, immediately, but um, uh, posting this up on the website and via our social channels is, is our next step once we've got these changes incorporated. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for your review. Ready to talk about serving our public in terms of director. Awesome. Okay, uh, the next item is our little activity that we've done throughout the course of this calendar year, which is the review of serving our public. Um, I have it on good word still, although it is not officially announced that this is the requirement for the application for the per capita grant this year. Uh, typically, we would be presenting the per capita grant application to you around this time for your approval. However, the uh, requirements for that have not yet been posted by the State Library. We anticipate that the due date for that will likely be sometime in March uh, to give everyone um, a little bit more breathing room this year with the pandemic to get the document compiled. Um, however, that requirement to do the full review of this guide um, is going to catch a few folks by surprise if they didn't you know, know about that before now. Um, but uh, we did get that word a little bit early on the, on the down low, so we've been working on it. And these are the final two chapters of our review. So today we're looking at chapters 12 and 13, technology and marketing and communications. And um, once again, as I've said all along, um, the, our library meets and exceeds in all of these categories. Um, there are a few points that I wanted to, uh, to call out here to share with you um, that we're actually working on right now. Um, under technology, um, number five relates to our website and remote access. Obviously, this has been um, our bread and butter this year with, with everything going remote. Um, we're also, as you know, planning to do a comprehensive website redesign this year. And one of the details that's, that's included in here is making sure that we meet various standards online, including ADA. Um, we will be doing rigorous testing on this website and we will make sure that it meets all of these guidelines as we go forward with that. So I want to make sure that you're aware that we're keeping track of those details and we'll incorporate those um, in that redesign. Um, in terms of um, you know, item six, the staff must be computer literate and trained and accessible. Um, gee, we, we certainly have all of that in spades. We're really excited about that. Um, we have partners for so many of our, of our online programming, and that is reflected in a lot of our activity this year. That's item seven. Um, item 11 is that we budget for ongoing technology needs, and we've certainly planned ahead this year for a lot of those changes. Um, so we're in compliance with that. Um, item 14 uh, calls out a number of our technological resources related to internet connectivity. And um, I did want to add and remind folks that um, we did an enhancement to our Wi-Fi network this year uh, during the pandemic to broadcast the Wi-Fi signal outside of the building. Uh, that's increasingly important when the library building is closed. I will say anecdotally last night as I was leaving, there were two cars in the parking lot and I saw people sitting in them um, connected to our Wi-Fi. Um, so that was a, a late night for me leaving, but I noticed that two folks were there taking advantage of that service. So we know that it is valuable. Um, okay, can I interrupt you for a moment? Yeah. Excuse me. Um, I do recall though that when we first talked about this, was there any um, co a community um, content or presentations or, or um, alert marketing of that because I think that's that's terrific. Obviously, people have gotten the word, but I'm not sure how they've gotten the word. It, it has been part of our communications about our remote services when we've talked about all the, the range of, of services that are available during the pandemic. Um, it is not it has not been a, a, a big highlight that we have posted. Um, it has been added to all the directories um, for statewide, which libraries are providing Wi-Fi services um, outside of their buildings. 
there's a network of um, uh, community service organizations that publish that and share it with those in need. Uh, so that's probably the best way to get it to the folks that need that information the most. Um, however, we can continue to broadcast that as part of all of our promotions regarding remote services. So thank you for the reminder. We'll make sure that that's included. I think it's just one way that we acknowledge while it's closed, people can't use the, uh, you know, the computers inside. If you have, I guess if you have some kind of laptop, you may not be coming to the library, but that we're, we're trying. And, and it, to me, that's goodwill and, and speaks to our um, Inclusive, the inclusivity. I mean, I, I would kind of second that. That's a really good point. I actually didn't think about it, but we're getting word that it's like 39 will start um, e -le or remote learning after Thanksgiving. And it's likely that it could be even to like MLK weekend. So I don't know if people need, e you know, better connections. They just need a break from being at home or something, I mean, maybe they'll hang out in the parking lot and do their, you know, do their e-learning or, or, you know, parents could be doing their online calls or, or work calls in, in the library. But we, at home, having all of us on, I, we cut my husband off a ton of times. And, um, and so that, that might be good to know. I mean, I didn't realize that, Anthony. So I love that there were two people outside last night. Mm -hmm. And that, that's helpful. That's really um, those are kind of the highlights for me about technology. I don't I have want to belabor one the question. questions. Yes. Uh, and uh, number 10, the library has a board adopted internet acceptable use policy that is reviewed annually. I don't think we review that annually. It has not been reviewed. So okay. um, having, having a policy that, that we can review, um, we have a policy. It hasn't okay. been reviewed in, in a number of years, I think since Ellen was director. So um, as we go through our comprehensive policy review, I mean, this is not a mandate, um, but it is, it is a, a guideline. So I do recommend that we review that as part of our plan in 2021 when we get through the rest of the policies. When we move through finance and we, and we put that behind us, let's get into some of these other details like this. Yes. Any other questions or comments about technology before we move on to marketing? Okay, so in marketing, I had a couple points I wanted to, to share. Um, and primarily, these, these are items that are reflected in the strategic plan update. So um, on the checklist, we do have a communications plan that ties back to our long range strategic plan. We have um, the library participates in a number of cooperative activities and that is highlighted in my strategic plan update. We can get into that depth here in a little bit. Um, we have a number of services and programs that are promoted throughout the community and, and means by which that we promote them. So we're not just static using our print newsletter, we've expanded our e-news and so on. Um, and it's interesting that they mentioned that we should have at least one social media account, and we do. We've got two. We're, we're maintaining our Facebook and Instagram accounts, and we have seen some pretty marked growth in activity on those pages this year in particular. Um, the rest of that, um, we, we meet all of those guidelines, and if you've got any further questions about communications and marketing, I'd be happy to take them now. Okay. Hey, Anthony, are we thinking about any other uh, social media channels? Uh, that's, that's all we've got right now. I guess I would say Nextdoor is another channel that we have joined this year. Um, we did our first official post on, on Nextdoor over the weekend regarding the closure. Um, but beyond that, um, we, we maintained a Twitter account for a while and that didn't really matter um, to the public. It didn't gain a lot of traction, uh, takes a lot of energy. So we decided to discontinue Twitter. Um, but beyond that, uh, we're not looking at getting any TikTok or Twitch or any of that type of stuff. So um, I think we're gonna stick with, with the two that we've got at the moment. Do you all have any suggestions? Are there other platforms that you're using? not using any other platform that's hysterical about TikTok, but you know, I was thinking that, you know, I wish that like the Wilmette Beacon had some type of online or Wilmette Live some had some type of online, um, you know, kind of venue for like a library. I loved the Wilmette Beacon used to give a week in advance kind of events happening in Wilmette and Wilmette Library was always part of that. And I, I, that's kind of just what I miss about, um, 
you know, the publication access that we had, but I know that's not social media, but. They are offering something, well, not like, right. And the reader, I think they're calling it the Wilmette Reader. The, my understanding is the group we're trying to bring, um, get funding for an offshoot and their um, staff that's what I'm hearing. from the beacon. I don't know the progress of it. Maybe, does anyone else know that? The North Shore record is, uh, I think, what, is that what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, right. And that is live. Right. Sorry, sorry, right. Uh, yep, the North Shore record is live. Um, just search North Shore record on Google and you'll find their page. Um, they, uh, they've they got a lot of content already. So um, definitely check it out. Um, I did talk to Marty, uh, the publisher um, over the weekend regarding our closure. He's got a story up about the library there. Um, he's been tracking a lot of the local news. He attended the, the um, new Trier board meeting last night and had a piece about that in the paper this morning, or well, the, the paper as it is. Um, it is going to be an online only publication as we've discussed before. So um, that's, I think the, the, big, the big shift is that we're, we're not seeing as much in print as before. Um, but the Wilmette Life, as I just showed, um, does still carry all, all those pages about the activities in the community, and the library's programs are, are generally picked up and published in that, in that publication. But Thank I you. second next door because I think no matter what goes on in the community, it pops up on next door of mine. And granted, you pick your communities that you want to be um, updated on. But it's it's um, going strong. Always, don't you agree, Fina? Are you on next door? I got my tuck pointer from next door through a feed. Right. So yeah, I use it. So uh, just out of curiosity, for those of you who are on next door, um, you may or may not be in the McKenzie neighborhood. Um, were you? Did you see our posting? Yes. Yeah. Great. All right, anything else about communications or marketing um, that's in the standards that you'd like to discuss? Okay, all right. Well then with that, I think we have completed our requirement for the review of the standards. So thank you all for taking the time this year to go through those. Um, we will make it a part of our, of, um, our activities in the future to, to do a review like this, but probably not in the depth that we have done over the course of this year. Um, but I will, I will provide you all with a digital copy of this. Um, with, our, with our print editions of the book, we did get digital versions. Um, so I'll make sure that you've all got a copy of it in your files for your review. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is the review of our pandemic response plan. On the agenda, which was published on Friday, <laughs> <laughs> I made a recommendation that um, we would move to close the library on November 23rd in response to the rising cases of the coronavirus in our community. And um, the, the, our plan all along has been that when the governor declares that um, we move into tier three of the Restore Illinois phase four plan, um, that we would probably need to close the doors of the library because limits would be imposed upon us. Uh, today, the governor gave an address, and this coming Friday, uh, the entire state is going to be moving into Tier 3, and there's a number of restrictions that were placed on uh, a, a number of organizations, um, particularly um, commercial entities, um, movie theaters in particular, restaurants, etc., were, were definitely affected. Grocery stores, less so, but capacity limits were certainly being imposed and some strong suggestions about our individual conduct in an effort to try to uh, limit the spread of the virus in our community. Uh, so that's been the governor's guidance uh, today. And over the last week or so, we've had similar recommendations, although recommendations, advisories, not specific orders, uh, to um, suspend activities. If we don't need to go out to Target and go shopping, we shouldn't do that sort of thing. Um, so on the advice of the Illinois Department of Public Health, Cook County Department of Public Health, uh, discussions with local officials, including our local coronavirus task force here in our community, uh, as well as peer advisory from our neighboring libraries, um, where I've learned and I've shared with you all that a number of our peer libraries have already taken those steps to close. Um, Glencoe is, uh, has been closed as well along with us. They call close at the same time. 
Uh, Winnetka Northfield is closing tomorrow. A number of area libraries um, have already been closed um, at this point. So it's, it is a trend uh, that we are making the pivot to go to curbside. So what happened over the weekend is um, Wilmette Library had our first um, COVID uh, staff member, our first uh, positive test. We've made it a long time this year without having a, um, a positive test on staff. Um, but when that happened, when that announcement came forth, um, we did contact tracing um, and we determined who the individuals were. Uh, that employee was, was in the library last on Tuesday, November 10th. And we learned of the, of the positive uh, test result on Saturday the 14th. And immediately following that, we um, did contact tracing and notified um, the staff members who were in contact with that individual. Um, we, we're looking at prolonged contact within six feet for a duration, a cumulative duration of 15 minutes or more. So we identified those individuals, notified them immediately and asked them to quarantine um, and isolate outside of the library for 14 days. Uh, so those were our procedures that we've had in place all along and we finally had an occasion to activate them. Um, because, of, because of that positive test, um, we're, we're doing more aggressive um, contact tracing within the library. We've gotten some mechanisms uh, that we've started with a daily uh, checklist that we're collecting digitally so that we can see who is in the building at a given time and um, whether or not they're presenting any symptoms. Um, this form um, is kind of, a, it's, a, it's a yes, no answer form. And if at any point you answer yes to one of those questions, you are asked to stay at home and not report to work. Uh, so that is another step that we're taking to keep track of our staff. We have also pivoted now to moving to work in teams uh, so that we can keep track of, of employees and uh, know who's working on a specific day and keep a regular schedule with those folks so we can limit um, the contact that individuals have with one another. Um, Monday uh, went really well um, uh, in terms of um, having the building closed and, uh, and moving right to curbside. Because we had done this previously, uh, we were able to immediately implement all of our plans. We had uh, a number of our communications were already drawn up. We had created signage in advance for the potential closure uh, a week from now. And we were able to activate that plan immediately. So staff did a wonderful job being prepared for this and anticipated it. And I think we did a fine job pivoting. Um, the community has done a great job as well in adapting to our procedures. Um, at, the, at the time of on Monday when we were um, moving to have the building closed, we had eight appointments for parking lot pickup. And um, uh, on Monday morning, we had dozens of appointments just for the first hour. Uh, so we're, we, we did a great job with that. Um, capacity has been fine. Uh, we haven't really had any hiccups. Uh, the public has adapted well. They're familiar with this service. And we think that we can continue to sustain this until there's an executive order that says the staff can't be in the building. Um, at this point, we don't think that that's going to impact us. We really feel like um, we're, we have procedures in place inside the building that we can operate effectively. And... Um, uh, and, and keep folks occupied in, inside the building with regular activities, including our upcoming RFID tagging project. Um, in terms of other procedures that we followed in the wake of the announcement on Saturday, we did a deep clean on Saturday and um, we did a disinfecting project on Sunday when the building was unoccupied. Uh, so we've been following all of our procedures there. Um, do you all have any questions about our updated service model or any of the procedures related to um, our positive test result? Um, Anthony, two, two questions. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. Anthony, what percentage of staff are in the library now with the way that you set them up working in pods at any one time? What percentage of the staff would you say are there versus what used to be there? Or numbers? Yeah, um, I, I would say at any given moment, it's probably about 20% of the team is in the building. Um, there are a few employees that are able to do their job primarily remotely, uh, and we're keeping the folks who can work remotely uh, that way as much as possible. Um, other folks will have a couple days a week that they'll be working remotely and then the rest inside the building. Um, but I would say on a given day, um, at any given point, it's probably no more than 20% of the staff are, are present in the building. Okay, thank you. And Anthony, my two questions are, um, number one, how is the employee doing um, who has COVID? And my second question is, in terms of the contact tracing, was there any sense of whether or not it, uh, how, that, how the employee 
was got exposed? Was it you know outside the library? Was it inside the library? Um, I, not inside the library. I, I can say that with certainty. Um, and um, I, I do believe the employee is doing fine. Um, at, at the time of the of the positive test, uh, the employee was asymptomatic. So that that is another thing that I think we all need to just kind of generally keep in mind yeah. is that there are, there are, is a possibility that you can be positive and not know it. So uh, just a, a small question: How long was this employee coming to work with the asymptomatic uh, symptoms or not? I, I can't answer that, but um, uh, I, I do know that the employee was, was last in the building on Tuesday and tested positive on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Anthony, maybe it's a little, uh, I don't need super specific, but when you said they did a um, deep clean and then they, there were two steps, just general, what's the, what's the difference? I'm, I'm of sorry. The clean, I'm, of the cleaning, of the, the cleaning uh, you said after the library closed on Saturday, there was step one, and then Sunday there was step two. Yeah, what, so, what, yeah what step, on? step one. Think. Step one is our professional cleaning service that comes in in the evening, and they have enhanced cleaning uh, techniques that they're using as a result of the pandemic. Uh, that's complete cleaning. And uh, they're, they're in the building every day. So um, that was a, that's our typical activity. And then our enhanced activity on Sunday included um, deeper disinfecting cleaning, including use of our UV lamp. Um, so we, and we're, we're using that more aggressively now than we have in the past. I, I think I've talked about this with you all before, but we've got a UV lamp um, that we bring around uh, to various spaces that are a little bit harder to clean with wipes. Um, the more complex spaces um, are, are ones that we use uh, with the lamp. So uh, we were in around to, to all the spaces where this individual may have been and uh, deep cleaned our circulation uh, department as well, where there's a lot of high contact um, with uh, where, where the public had been and where the staff tends to be more highly concentrated. So we're doing that every day now with deep cleaning. Thank you. It's amazing how fast your communications plan went into effect. So thanks for being prepared. Yes. Now, if the governor uh, proposes a total lockdown, then will the ev every library uh, activity that's now in place be shut down also, like the pick up, pick up at the outside? If we are told that we must shelter in place, um, then that, that would be the step, yes. OK. Mm -hmm. We are certainly hoping it doesn't go that way because we've got right. a lot of work to do here and we are banking on that, uh, yeah. that RFID project for this winter. Mm -hmm. So we're still holding out hope for that. Okay. Let's hope it doesn't go that long. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Are you ready to give your director's report? All right, thank you. Um, there's a, there's a lot of information to share in my report this month. Um, there, appended to my report is an annual summary of the strategic plan progress, um, and I sent that to you via email as well. That I'm not going to get into any depth here unless you want to discuss that specifically, but what I will talk about um, are a couple highlights from my report, and then you can ask me any questions you'd like. Um, so I wanted to, to draw specific attention to a couple items. Um, Stephen called out our overdrive um, uh, uh, product in particular on page three of the uh, digital uh, collections report. And I just wanted to draw your attention to our Advantage collection. As I've mentioned before, Advantage is our unique Wilmette and Kenilworth only patrons um, ebook titles, and we have radically increased the volume of material that's available there over the course of this year, and there's some statistics that are attached to that. Um, combined, we have access to over 48,000 unique titles with 94,000 copies. So we know there's a lot of demand for some specific titles. We try to keep our holds ratio very low so that people get instant access to their materials. Uh, we know that that is one of the, um, the pieces that people expect most when they're getting digital collections. They don't like to wait for things. Um, so that has been one of the ways that we've been able to deliver some successes this year with digital collections. Um, before I move forward with anything else, any questions about our digital collections as that's where there's a lot of attention focused this year. Our circulation has doubled 
Um, pretty much over the whole year, we've had a couple months where we nearly tripled our circulation in digital. Is, does anyone have any questions or comments about our digital collections? Just to, what, <clears throat> what would be the, the ones that were clearly uh, used more than others or the more popular? Um, I don't have that off the top of my head, Jan, but, um, okay. it, but we do um, in our annual report in that in the digital report for, um, uh, for Adobe Spark, if you scroll through mm -hmm. that, there is a section that talks about our most popular titles this year, and okay. those would certainly be included in that. Um, mm -hmm. Annually, our most popular ones largely uh, focus around our Meet the Author um, and One Book titles, right. and that was certainly very true. Uh, this year, um, even though our one book event did not happen uh, this spring because that coincided right around the time that we were forced to close in March, um, American Dirt still remains one of the most popular books this year. Um, mm -hmm. So I know that title's up there. Arshay Cooper really performed extremely well as well as Steve from X Candy's book. Mm -hmm. I got I noticed, um, uh, American Dirt, excuse me, it was number one of most requested. Of, of fiction, then I liked how you uh, divided fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of uh, response to the Kendi per, uh, performance uh, that was very, very positive. And uh, people liked the fact that it uh, involved more than just one library, that it was, you know, three or four. And of course, the, the woman who asked the questions was really superior. She really thought about what she wanted to, to ask. And that added to the whole climate of the presentation. So I, that's a great thing. Take that and uh, keep doing it <laughs> when we can, if we can. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback off of Jan's statement there. That was a point I wanted to share with you all. So on, on November 9th, we did host, um, along with 10 other libraries in the area, uh, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, who, who had a, a wonderful presentation uh, that was enjoyed by 6,000 participants um, across the area. That's amazing. Area. Yeah. Uh, really impressive. And um, we got some really great data uh, that came out of that. I shared some, some anecdotal feedback. Um, at least 128 of the Wilmette uh, attendees um, provided narrative feedback to us, which was wonderful. Great. I included a few examples um, of those statements in my report for you. Um, we're hoping that we can continue to do partnerships like this in the future. We've already got another one in the works. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it's too soon to talk about it, but um, we, like, we like partnering. So um, it's a great, great way to leverage these resources. I'll just comment. I think, too, some of the local synagogues and churches also participated. So I, that really is a, a great collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that was Natalie Moore. She's on WBEZ. Uh, I uh -huh. hear about her and she's written and um, reported. She just wrote a book about the South Side, probably about two years ago, the details. Hmm. Journalistic then, fiction. Okay. Um, immediate, I guess I'll, I'll mention that immediately prior to our, our Kendi event was our Meet the Author event with um, Arshay Cooper. And that was also a very successful event for us. It was our first time um, doing uh, a Meet the Author event virtually. We had um, 485 attendees for that event, which is outstanding. Um, that would have been a sellout in the junior high. Uh, yeah. Probably far more convenient for folks if they could do it from home. So uh, this is something we may consider um, going forward, even when we're not in pandemic times, that we might be able to do a simulcast um, uh, and provide folks uh, access digitally as well. Um, we did two book discussions as well with our librarians on that North event. Huh? You know what living is. And just That's the book thing. Nice, Stuart. Thank you. Sure, sure, Joan. Thank you. You always are on in the backgrounds. <laughs> Try to be on topic, you know. Right. <laughs> um, we typically partner with a local bookstore when we do our Meet the Author events, and this year we did partner with um, a local bookstore. This time, Semicolon Books in Chicago is a Black female owned bookstore, um, and they provide signed copies of the book. Um, so I, I don't have metrics on that on how many on how many copies were sold, but um, I know I've got mine. Um, 
any, I any think questions? that was great. I want to commend you on that. I, I don't know if there's someone that we can say thank you so much for co collaborating with that, but very, very right on. Staff that put that event together, that was definitely something that they wanted to do. So, um, you know, Rachel Garcia uh, was our, and Jill uh, McEwen were our two um, leads on that project, along with our programming partners, Amy Barrow and Barbara Goodman. Um, we were really satisfied with how that event came together. So we're hoping is, to do that again in the spring. You mentioned uh, Garcia a lot. Is it possible to have her come and talk a little bit more about looking at diversity policies and what, based on all the things you've said that she's looked into, staff and everything else? We can do that. That might be an interesting discussion when things, not January, because we'll probably be full, but at some point in time. Sure. Sure, and I think it also bears mention too that um, the head of our digital services department, Stephen Kobel, um, is also the chair of the library's equity, diversity, and inclusion committee, and he was just appointed to the Rails equity, diversity, and uh, inclusion committee as well. So we've got um, system-wide representation um, there uh, too. So I'm really, really proud of Stephen and the work that he's done, and uh, his his committee's got an awful lot of work ahead of them. So. Question, would you ever let them look at our policies to see if there are areas that we should explore at some point in time to just do an audit? Yes, this is definitely part of, um, we're, we're looking at doing diversity audits across the board. Um, we're looking for opportunities to improve our policies to make sure that they're as inclusive as possible and in an effort to try to expose any implicit bias or the way that we phrased any of our policies. So that's definitely part of their work as well is an internal look too. It's a great suggestion, Lisa. Thank you. Um, let's Can I see. ask a question about your statistics or do you want to cover something else? It's go for it. <laughs> okay. If I'm looking at, so I'm con trying to compare 2019 to 2020. And so if I look, totals number of items is 375623 in 20. It's actually up over 2019. Which, can you tell me which pages we're looking at, Lisa? Uh, it's at the back where you do the Wilmet statistics in terms of looking at, I was just trying to figure out how to read it and how to compare year to year. It was the last two pages of your report. All right, well, there's actually six pages of statistics there. There's, there's four compared right. pages year over year. I was looking at monthly statistics. Okay. Activity at Wilmette Library Stations, or is that? Yep, they both have that at the top. So is it the collection one or material type? Maybe you should tell us the best way to read it, because I've not, or have not paid attention to this one before. And I think that might be helpful. OK, tell you what. Um, what I can do is I will provide you, we're, we're actually analyzing a way to better present these statistics yeah. so that they can be side by side with one another. We currently don't have a, me a mechanism to combine them. Um, we're, we're printing them out on a monthly basis. Uh, but I would like to pre present this to you in a way that you can see it in a snapshot to compare between year over year. Uh, so let's, let's plan to do that with future presentations of the stats. Perfect, because it was hard for, to sort of figure out exactly what was going on. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would say that overall, as I've been telling folks, um, one of the things that impresses me about our statistics in the wake of the pandemic is that our circulation is remarkably strong. Um, we have averaged between being down just four to 8% um, over last year, uh, <laughs> which I find is absolutely remarkable considering the fact that the hours of the building are approximately two thirds of what we have had in, um, in the previous year. Um, our door counts, uh, when the library um, has been open uh, these past four months, have been down just 40% um, over last year, and that's with reduced hours. So our, our library enjoys um, high engagement with our community. Um, folks love their materials. They love coming in. They love to browse, and they are voracious readers. They love to check out stuff. So um, we're, we're really seeing some pretty impressive statistics that I have to say that my peers are not seeing the same type of uh, traffic in their libraries. Mm. So kudos to our community for their use of the library. Absolutely. Could I just ask this one question about Libby? Um, do you have any sense of the uh, effectiveness of Libby as a digital, digital resource? 
Um, I think this is one I'd have to lean a little bit more on, on uh, the anecdotal type of response okay. that I mm -hmm. received. And yeah. I would say that by and large, Libby is one of the few uh, library resources that people refer to by name. It is, and, and as such, it is one of the most popular resources um, that we offer. I think mm -hmm. people are resolutely very satisfied with that product. Um, that is the OverDrive platform, as I mentioned before. And as you know, we've talked about this previously. We have, we've got a partnership with District 39, um, mm -hmm. where we launched our, uh, um, our collection to be listed along with their Sora interface, uh, so that all D39 students have immediate access to the public library's resources alongside their own curricular resources through D39. Uh, that's so great. that's driving a lot of use of our product as well. Awesome. Good. Thanks. Anthony, have we looked at doing that with Nutrier at all? Uh, we have open conversations with Nutrier about their collections too. Um, we haven't quite gotten to the stage that we are with D39. That is a work in progress and we're certainly looking to expand that, that connection. I'm also looking to try to do that with our other partner agencies too. And I've been approached by the parochial schools to see if there wouldn't be something we might be able to do there as well. Good. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunity for sure. us to increase our participation with partnerships. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, anything else from my report? I guess you going back a bit. Um, yeah. Sorry, I missed it. You might hear my colleagues in the background expressing their opinions as well. <laughs> um, but um, now that you've had some time to think about what a you know shutdown library looks like, do you anticipate? Uh, fewer staff hours? Do you anticipate, high, you know, having less uh, payroll hours while we're shut down? And do we anticipate changing our time and a half policy on Sunday while we're in this shutdown period? Uh, to the first question, um, no, I don't see any, any need for us to reduce uh, the, the demand in staffing. In fact, I think we're being stretched in a lot of different directions right now. Staff is incredibly busy. Um, and there's a lot of special projects for us to work on. So even if the building is closed uh, to the public, um, right now the, the staff is incredibly busy fulfilling um, all the needs that are provided by the uh, remote services, including parking lot pickup. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the building answering the phones during our regular operating hours and um, continuing our services even outside of those hours. So the staffing demand is certainly still there. And with RFID tagging project coming up, um, there may be even be some opportunity for staff to, to add a few hours because uh, we're going to need folks to step up and complete that project within a certain time frame. Uh, so no, I actually, I don't think that we're going to need to reduce um, our staffing demand. Um, in terms of uh, Sundays, uh, since the library is not opened on Sunday and is generally not occupied except by facilities staff on Sundays, um, that is not a topic that we're, we're needing to, to work on at this point. However, as we get into next year and we start looking forward uh, to reopening and um, uh, you know, hopefully with the vaccine and whatnot, we'll, we'll be able to see our, our library open again on a more regular schedule. I do think that's a good time for us to look back at our statistics for, uh, for Sunday use, to look at our hours, our door counts, uh, our general staff demand and to look at a, um, you know, what, what our best service uh, mechanisms would be for Sundays. Um, and at that time, I think it would be appropriate for us to discuss that again. So we still are paying time and a half on Sundays? Not uh, no, we don't, we don't have anyone on Sundays. Oh, good. It's oh, called open on Sunday. Yeah. I, I'm sure I'm so this is the part I'm trying to understand if we and I just might not under, I clearly don't understand it. I thought we were at like 20% capacity when the library's closed. And if on weekends we don't have folks there, just help me understand how we're still running at full steam uh, given that. Well, the library is a busy place. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of demand for our services and um, we're, we're making the most of, of uh, the hours that we've got available. Um, staff, are, staff are in here trying to fulfill all those services within the hours that we have provided. The library is open on Saturdays and we have staff in the building from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, our public service hours directly are 10 to 3 on Saturdays, um, but staff are still fulfilling all of their duties within those time frames. Um, Monday through Friday, the building is open to staff uh, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
So there's still ample opportunity for staff to fulfill all their duties within that 12 hour time frame, that not just the hours that were open to the public. And to say all the programming and planning that's gone on for all your online programs. I get those, I mean, you have a whole host all for all ages. I think it's great from adults to tots. The, the baby's program still goes on. Online. I would say we're There's probably doing more programming now than we have. Um, it's, it's been a very busy time for staff. <laughs> and the STEM activities are very uh, well liked by my grandkids. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any more questions regarding Director Austin's report? Jan, anything regarding ILA? I enjoyed your fight song. Dr. Rogers, <laughs> when you received your award. And <laughs> I'm just sorry they didn't let you say anything. And this is in regard to when he accepted the ILA yeah, trustee of yeah. the year. I agree. The yeah. system recognized me. They moved on to someone else. <laughs> All of we five old seconds. Old news, Ron. <laughs> old news. I really, yeah. I mean, the the challenges of trying to do that virtually are immense. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, well done anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as far as the ILA, not much more than, you know, what we've heard reported here about what libraries are trying to do and close down and all of that. Uh, what was one interesting report? This was in Georgia. Um, it was actually at the University of Georgia decided that um, there was a problem with many of their staff just as kind of, and issues of mental health, um, which we probably all have issues with at this point. Uh, but they did bring in somebody to, probably on Zoom, to uh, have a program that would help librarians in the libraries to deal with mental problems as well as overload uh, with everything that's happening. So that was just an interesting aside. I don't know if that's something that we would want to undertake or have done, but it might come up at some point. Other than that, no, there's nothing else. Thank you. <laughs> Director Austin, Rails, I know that you talked about changing the number of time, days that they incubate. Yes, uh, incubate is, I don't know if that's the right <laughs> term. I don't <laughs> want to incubate, I know. My sons had, had me laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rails has been monitoring the, um, the OCLC <laughs> realm study ever since um, that was announced back in March. And uh, the, the science there has suggested that quarantine of materials um, for three days is, is deemed appropriate. Rails has kind of vacillated and has a number of recommendations for us right. over the last many months and um, recently required us to do seven and um, did relax that recently back to three. Um, and that is what we are doing now here locally. So um, all materials that are returned to the library are quarantined for a period of three days and checked in on the fourth day. Mm -hmm. And um, if you've got any questions about the system in relation to um, their coronavirus response, there is a page I've shared with you and it's also there on your agenda. Um, uh, go to their COVID page. If you go to railslibraries.info, um, they've got a window um, right there at the top um, dedicated to COVID and there's a reporting tool where you can pull that up and see uh, the current status of all the member libraries in Rails. And uh, there's a whole range of, of metrics and data that they're collecting about uh, availability of certain services. I will say that that document um, is, is reliant upon uh, the directors to update it and not everyone gets it updated regularly, but whenever we've taken a step to make any changes, I've made a point of updating our information on there so you can compare mm -hmm. with others and see. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> Do you see interlibrary loan being shut down, the service? You know, that's largely going to be up to, um, I think, uh, Rails and CCS to determine. Um, right now, we are doing intra-CCS loans. Mm -hmm. um, we, we send out a lot of bins every night um, and receive a lot each morning. Um, so we hope that we can continue to do that because that's one of the great advantages of our system participation uh, and resource sharing. But um, for right now, it's still operational and we hope to keep it that way. 
Related to that, Anthony, what's the latest thinking on our drop boxes in our uh, Chrysler Pacifica? <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, this week we're, we're meeting to discuss our delivery and outreach um, services. Uh, the van is going to start getting into service once um, our new um, all-weather mats are going to be installed, I think, on Friday. And uh, then we're going to start doing the uh, remote book drop collections resuming again on Monday the 23rd. Uh, so we're happy to have those reopen to create that convenience for folks, especially now that the main library is um, closed. How are you going to communicate that? So you'll be opening up the park district one on the west side? Yep. All okay. of Okay, good. And that, That's that, great. that detail um, was in our email communications over the weekend, and we will be highlighting that in all of our forthcoming uh, communications as well. <clears throat> who will be driving the van? Who's, this, who's um, trained or you said the whole dashboard is, is like, you know, wild, like, Ian Musk designed it. It, it, it is it's a little bit like a spaceship in there. Um, there's a lot of, because it is a hybrid, it's got a lot of interesting features to kind of monitor the, the systems and so on. But um, uh, a number of staff will be driving it. So primarily facilities staff will be driving it in the morning when they do the, the, um, the deliveries or the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the remote book drop pickups. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in the afternoon, we're going to be doing deliveries and outreach to our partner agencies, whether it's preschools, um, Mather, any, any other locations that we're making those deliveries to. Um, and that'll be done by the staff that are doing those deliveries. So it's, it may be a youth services librarian, um, someone in adult services. There'll be a number of folks that will be um, eligible to, to do the driving. And they'll we'll be trained, so yes. to speak. I mean, yes. It's There's different to drive a small a car. I drive a small car, I think, to then to driving a larger van. It is a minivan. It's, it's a passenger vehicle. But yes, um, it is a little bit different experience. So we're encouraging folks that are going to be working with the vehicle to uh, take it for a spin um, around the neighborhood to get familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And don't go through downtown Wilmette. There's a, <laughs> a large chasm you have to drive over. Yeah, right at the intersection of uh, Wilmette Avenue and Central, there's, there's exactly. a lot of a dip. Mm -hmm. Any information items? Changing on the information, is there any communication or Dropbox information that you received? Okay. You see the closures for Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year, and December. Christmas the, the, and New Year's, are there any questions regarding those? With Director Austin, we had voted and approved those. And then... Um, I, I will add a point. There's been a couple of questions about this. Um, the day before Thanksgiving, the library would typically close at 5 p.m. Uh, we are going to just keep our regular hours that day. We'll be open till 6 p.m. Um, because we're, we're closing early anyway. Um, and there was a question about um, if we're going to be open on the 26th. And uh, yes, we are. So we, when you get into December, there's those, there's those Saturdays. Um, that are around the holidays, we will be open on those Saturdays. So we're not getting a, a big four-day weekend. It's um, just the, the Thursday, Friday, and then we're back on Saturday. Okay. Thank you. And there are three seats that are uh, open for the seven-member seven board, and they will be open Tuesday, April 2nd for the election. And you can get information online or through Director Austin's office but yet the packets since they cannot be picked up anthony i think you mentioned that yes that they will can all be online or they're, they're they online and they can okay. also be picked up um, this page will be updated on the website um, we, we just had to compile all the information as we made this pivot when the building closed historically that packets would be available in the administration office we're developing a website right now I hope to have it live tomorrow that has more information about that. Um, as it stands, if, if you know of anyone that has any questions um, uh, about their candidacy, Cook County Board of Elections uh, website is the place to go um, in the meantime, but we will have a page up on our trustee site that will provide um, all, the, all the packet information that you need and all the necessary dates uh, so that you can collect your signatures and so on. 
Will you be certifying them or notarizing them or do they have to go get their own notary? Yeah, we've got a notary on staff, um, but just one. So that there'll need to be a bit of coordination regarding the notary. And there is there, there will be a note about the notaries in, in that website. Okay. Thank you. There's a website that you can go to that will show where, where notaries are if, if you're not able to get the one here at the library. Just an aside, I read something recently that uh, many notaries are going to an online, as you'd expect, um, kind of approach. I think 28 states have gone to that now, a virtual notarization. I don't know if Illinois is, is one of them. It didn't list the states. It just said this process is now available. Okay. Is there any new business? Old business? Yes. I just wanted to be sure that maybe we could schedule um, some committee meetings, um, particularly the policy ones. I think that I mentioned this, I think, at the end of the September meeting, but um, I think we need to revise and review some policies that are up. Investment well, policy, I think. Well, that would be first goes to the finance committee. And then the finance committee will take it to the policy committee. So the finance okay. committee would need to, and I think at this point, I know uh, Director Austin and, and it's Rogers. Just, I think I would just suggest a, sh a brief meeting then for the finance committee so that maybe we can just get something on schedule. I don't want to discuss any or revise anything right now. I think it's just so that we can get a good schedule going forward for 2021. Okay. Would that be all right? A short finance committee meeting? We need it. We may be able to achieve that without a meeting. Okay, sounds good. Well, let's talk then offline. Or do you want to just send a doodle poll with some times when you think the policy would be ready for review? Okay. Would that work? We can do that. Would that work? Yeah. Trustee Riddle, just a doodle poll of available dates and times when people can meet. Well, first we need to determine when the policies will be ready. The okay. last time that I was aware of it, we they were still in draft form. All right, so Ron and I are going to review those policies and give it the attorney review, and um, then we can schedule a meeting um, and go through those policies again and make our make our actions and get that stuff moving forward to policy committee. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Any old business? Okay, I need to get a motion to adjourn. Oh, a motion to adjourn? Wait a minute. Oh, sorry. Go into oh, wait special. A I've got to, to do go something in. special. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> that way, okay. Uh, I need to uh, do a motion. Let's see, let me get the right motion. Okay, uh, what we need to do is close, the, what we do is move out of this meeting, go to close meeting, and then come back again into open this meeting again, announce what's happening and then close it again. So when we move, we will be moving to a separate room because it will be for trustees only. So can I have a motion? Well, I'm gonna move. Can I move it so I don't have to say it? Sure. You can second it, Cause generally I don't move, but uh, I move to close the opening meeting and to re reconvene in a closed meeting to perform the annual review of the WPLD director's performance and compliance with 5 ILCS 120-2C-1. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, and I think we have to take a roll call and write it down. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee McDonald and seconded by Trustee Wolf that we move to a closed meeting to discuss uh, and then reconvene to perform the annual review for the director. Can we have a roll call? Trustee Barshis, yes. <clears throat> Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. It's been moved. It's been uh, unanimously approved. 
And so now we're going to perform some magic with a little help from my friends. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to pause the recording for our regular meeting and um, I'm going to make Lisa the meeting host then and move you all into your breakout room. And then when you're finished with your closed session, you'll come back out into open session. Lisa will make me the host again and we'll resume the recording of this meeting. Um, and Lisa will also make sure that the closed session is recorded. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna go through that. We're going to pause. Okay. Okay, in compliance with the Illinois Open Meeting Act, President McDonnell announced in open meeting that the Wilmette Public Library District trustees in closed meeting voted to recommend that, that Wilmette Public Library District trustees in open meeting. So, The Wilmette Public Library's annual sale, uh, the Wilmette Public Library District move to increase the director's annual salary to, let me read it exactly, $132,000 effective 1 1 2021 and provide a $5,000 bonus in this calendar year. It was approved uh, by five and uh, it was approved by six of the trustees okay. and trustee Johnson had to leave at 8.30 so he was absent for that motion. So we would like to at this point endorse in open meeting the actions taken in closed meeting. I will so move. So can we move to accept the recommendations of the uh, Wilmette Public Library trustees in closed meeting. So, we'll also move that as well. Okay, and can we have a second to the motion? I'll, I'll second. Okay, Will Fishman, can we have a roll call? Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman, yes. Trustee D. Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle, absent. Trustee Rogers, yes. Trustee Wolf, yes. Trustee McDonald, yes. And the motion carried. And before we adjourn the meeting, we talked about the evaluation. And Anthony, we have been extremely pleased with your work. And we will, I'll go over with you in detail some of our thoughts and what we're most pleased in terms of the accomplishments of how you've kept the library going in COVID. And even with the library closing, how we've had over 90% uh, we've only reduced uh, in terms of circulation by about 10% of last year's service. Given staff turnover, you have had a whole new management team that you've had to slowly hired and trained. But most of all, I guess you just kept going like the little engine that could in during COVID and kept both the patrons as well as the staff safe. So we are very pleased with what you've done and we look forward to seeing greater things. <laughs> and we hope you learn to delegate a little bit more <laughs> so that we can just see all those wonderful ideas explode and that you give time to do that. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Can we have a motion to adjourn the open meeting? I will motion to adjourn the open meeting. I'll second. It's been moved by Trustee Wolf to adjourn the open meeting and it's been seconded by Trustee Fishman. Can we have a roll call? Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle, absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. And so the meeting adjourned at 9.05. Thank you, and everybody have a happy Thanksgiving. You as well. Thank, Thank you. You, you too. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Anthony. Thank, Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Marcy, Gail, John, and Anthony. Yes. <laughs>